Hey, we'll just start with the dark forest. The universe is incredibly big and seems full of potential for life with billions of habitable planets. If an advanced civilization had the technology to travel between the stars at just 0.1% of the speed of light, it could colonize our galaxy in roughly 100 million years, which is not that long given the billions of years the Milky Way has existed. So in principle, any spacefaring civilization should be able to spread rapidly over huge sectors of the galaxy. And yet we see nothing, hear nothing. The universe seems empty, devoid of others. This is the Fermi Paradox, which we've discussed in more detail in other videos. Confronted with the seemingly empty universe, humanity faces a dilemma. We desperately want to know if we are alone in the Milky Way. We want to call out and reveal ourselves to anyone watching, but that could be the last thing we ever do. Because maybe the universe is not empty. Maybe it's full of civilizations, but they are hiding from each other. Maybe the civilizations that attracted attention in the past were wiped away by invisible arrows. Maybe. This is the dark forest solution to the Fermi Paradox. I have already checked out the Fermi Paradox series, so I'll link that for you down below. The way of life. The hunter awakes in his hiding place and carefully listens for suspicious noises from the thick undergrowth before he gets up. Another night has passed without incident. The forest is dark and full of fog. He considers calling out to others to end his loneliness, but stops himself at the last moment. What if they are like him? All living things seek to survive, secure resources and multiply. Their greatest obstacle are other living things that share the same objective. Competition between species favored the survival of beings with advantageous yeah. traits. Our ancestors were inventive, competitive, expansionist and greedy for resources, which led them to winning the competition for our planet. Today, most other animals are so utterly at our mercy that we wipe out about a dozen species a day, just as an unintentional byproduct of how we like to run things. I looked into that after watching a George Carlin video randomly but how many species goes extinct a day seems to vary wildly depending on the scientist or the paper that you're reading i've seen quoted anywhere up to 150 species going extinct a day and that was cited from a un convention to as little as 24 species in a day but this video said that 12 species what did he say we wipe out 12 species a day as a byproduct of the way we like to run things which sounds about right to me, who has absolutely no authority on the matter. I read that all of the numbers are based off of estimations in general, because we don't know the actual population of animals on Earth, let alone when the last of a species dies in some cases. I'll actually, I'll look for some articles on that and add them for you if you'd like. But humans are more than individuals. From us, cultures emerge that also mm -hmm. compete with each other. Competitive and expansionary cultures spread faster and further and merge with, subdue or destroy others. If we look at our history, it becomes clear we are dangerous. Not just to others, but also to ourselves. Our human nature has driven us to take over every corner of our planet and soon we will look to the stars, both to expand our domain and ensure access to ever more resources. And then we might stumble upon others trying to do the same thing. It's likely that the competition of life also takes place on faraway planets. So it's logical to assume that an alien civilization that came to dominate their planet would be in some regards similar to us. But if they're similar to us, they too may be dangerous. The implication. As the hunter sneaks through the dark forest all alone, he knows that there might be others like him. He can't know their intentions, if they are aggressive or not. The hunter knows he would kill to ensure his own survival, so he has to assume that they would too. And it might be that if he stumbles upon another hunter, the one that shoots first survives. 
None of this means that conflict is unavoidable. So far, the progress of the modern world seems to have made us more peaceful, not more violent. Maybe this is true for other civilizations too, that eventually progress means less conflict, not more. Different alien civilizations also should vary from the mild and peaceful to the malevolent and militaristic. The existential problem we're facing is that when we meet others between the stars, we have no way of telling who is peaceful or aggressive and what their true intentions are. Yes. Similarly, they might not understand or trust our intentions, even if we tell them that we are peaceful. We don't even know our fellow humans' intentions sometimes. In Dark Forest, the book, and now I'm not sure if the hypothesis comes first or the book comes first, so you guys will have to let me know. They get into what was just explained here, which is the chain of suspicions. If we group civilizations in two categories of dangerous and not dangerous, and I think the author uses the words malevolent and benevolent, you'd probably destroy the dangerous civilization before they had the opportunity to do the very same thing to you. But if a civilization isn't dangerous, you'd still have to consider that they might think you're dangerous, therefore might attack you to protect themselves preemptively, leading to you possibly needing to attack whether they're dangerous or not. The book explains it a lot better than I just did. But now that I'm thinking about it, a lot of game theory goes into that. On top of that, if we did discover another civilization and they discovered us, the light years between us would mean years of communication delay. Both sides yeah. would be in a state of uncertainty, wondering if the wisest move is to just attack because there's another serious issue, technological explosions and the first strike advantage. We don't know That's where the limits too. of technology are, but we do know how much technological progress matters in war. A few hundred or thousand years can turn conflict with uncertain results into a one-sided massacre. Caesar's legions would stand no chance against Napoleon's army with their cannons and muskets, which would be eradicated by artillery from the First World War, which would not stand a chance against today's drones and guided missiles. So the power level of different civilizations may vary massively, and even if not, between the time it takes us to detect another civilization and us saying hi, we might already be hopelessly behind on the tech tree. Which is bad enough, but the nature of interstellar conflict makes this worse. If your opponent is light years away, sending an invasion fleet takes so long that by the time it arrives, it might be hopelessly obsolete. So war between civilizations might be just about eliminating the other to remove an existential threat to yourself. That's bleak, but technological explosion is a curious one to think about because hypothetically, you know that you're more technologically savvy than your opponent. Therefore, have the means to destroy them if it comes to that. But say their planet is 200 years away, just as an example. So you know you'd have the tech to do it, but by the time you get there, they've had 200 years to develop even better technology. And that just makes me think of how far our technology has developed in the past 200 years. I can't think of what we were doing in 1823. But in 1815, Napoleon was fighting the Battle of Waterloo, and so many things technologically have advanced since then, which is wild. Someone else who might be so scared of you that they attack the first chance they get. In this environment, the only way to guarantee a win is to strike with such force and speed that the target has no chance of survival or time to counterattack or escape to seek revenge later. The stakes are the highest possible with no room for error. If we assume that the majority of civilizations live on planets, that leaves them pretty vulnerable. All you need to do is throw something massive at a planet to make it uninhabitable. So the ultimate interplanetary annihilation weapon is probably something like a relativistic kill vehicle, a missile shot at a planet at a significant fraction of the speed of light. For example, a missile the size of a person going 95% the speed of light has as much energy as all nuclear bombs on Earth. If you shot a few dozen at the civilization you wanted to wipe out, success would be fairly certain, even a single hit would suffice. This is not that absurd of an idea. 
A civilization only slightly above us on the Kardashev scale would have enough energy to send multiple strikes against every planet it suspects of harboring life. What makes these weapons so sinister is how much they favor a first strike, since they would be so fast that it might be impossible to protect yourself effectively against them once they're launched. Conflict between civilizations may not be lengthy affairs, but rapid winner-takes-all situations, where the first one to shoot wins. This makes any civilization an existential threat to any other. And if every civilization is an existential threat to every other, there may be only two kinds of civilizations out there. Quiet ones and dead ones. So what should we do? Should we worry? It's unlikely that anybody has noticed humanity yet. The radio signals we've transmitted in the last 100 years traveled a relatively tiny distance and have long decayed into unreadable noise. At our technological stage, if we don't actively try to get noticed, and if nobody specifically looks at our pretty unremarkable solar system, we'll stay hidden. But one day we will venture into space in a serious way and need to consider these kinds of questions again. We don't know if there are others or if we are going through the forest alone. But we have no way of knowing for sure. For the time being, it seems the best we can do is to carefully listen. And even if we see others step into a clearing and make themselves known, we should not reply right away, but carefully watch them from the undergrowth. Perhaps we are also thinking about this all wrong by allowing our primitive brain that evolved in the context of the gruesome competition of life to conjure fears of predatory aliens all around us. Maybe the also fact that we are looking at the universe like this is a sign that we are not grown up yet as a species. There could be a friendly, welcoming community of alien civilizations waiting to hear from us when we are ready. As for now, the good news is there is actually little we need to do. We just need to be thoughtful about the signals we send out into the galaxy. We need to watch the sky and learn more about our galaxy, our forest. Because whatever the nature of our forest is, full of dangers or friends, or nobody at all, only careful observation can tell. So, let's do that. At last, the hunter reaches a clearing and finds a comfortable position. Slowly, the sun melts the fog away. Lost in thought, he admires the vegetation until suddenly he is eye to eye with another hunter, frozen in terror, just like himself. His mind is racing, considering all the different options. The hunter takes a deep breath and makes a decision. Maybe the only way out of the dark forest is to step into the clearing together. That's wholesome. And with this hopeful picture, we say goodbye to the year 12,021. This official... channel is unmatched explaining these concepts. I'll make sure to add it in the description. But as far as my thoughts on dark forest, I'm in the camp that thinks that if a species is intelligent enough to travel to another planet, they would probably have, instead of probably, I'll say likely have, motivations that would hinder them from just wanting to destroy it. But then again, the whole thing is based off of speculation and a lot of assumptions. Therefore, if anything, I take it as more of a thought experiment than anything else. But there are no right answers or wrong answers, so... Leave your ideas down below. I'd also like to watch a video exploring the numerically improbable, but not altogether impossible thought that we're the first intelligent species in the Milky Way. Therefore, we're not in a dark forest yet. Although personally, I do think that there is intelligent life out there. We just may be so far away from each other that we won't meet in my lifetime. So for a literary recommendation, Dark Forest is book two in a series. I've actually only read the second book and it's by a Chinese author whose name is not going to come to me. So I'll have to find it for you. It goes deeper into the concepts mentioned here. If you're into that, it is science fiction. I also mentioned game theory. There's a free course that I took on game theory 
a few years ago now that I found useful because I like strategy games, not video games, but I like poker, for example, and a lot of those concepts overlapped. So if you're into that, I highly recommend it. And that's all I really have to say. Leave your thoughts on any of this, drop any more recommendations, and that's all from me. Thanks for watching with me. Oh.